Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does on this cold, snowy weekend in Metro DC, I invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 6. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. Mark chapter 6. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Loudoun and Arlington and Moco and Prince William, as well as those of you online. It's good to be together around God's Word. And especially if you're visiting with us, whether you've come with a friend or a family member or you're exploring Christianity or the church on your own, we are really, really glad you're here or are watching in. I was at the young adult retreat this weekend. It was so good. Just hundreds of young adults together and hearing different stories of different ones of them coming to NBC on a Sunday over the last six months or a year or two or three and not knowing Jesus when they came here, meeting Jesus here and the trajectory of their lives changing for all of eternity in a way that I, I pray will happen among multitudes more young adults and men, women, children of all ages, which actually leads to why this gathering today is significant for two particular reasons. So one, we're right in the middle of the 2022 Metro DC spring break mission trip. And if that is a surprise to you or doesn't make any sense to you, then go back and listen to last week's gathering. But to summarize, in Mark chapter 6, verse 7 through 13, so the verses right before where we're going to read in a few minutes, we saw Jesus send out his disciples on a short-term mission trip. And we said we're going to do the same. We're going to set aside these two weeks specifically to go out across our city in Jesus' name, caring for people in need and inviting people to believe in the gospel, the good news of God's love for them. And last week, I asked you to send updates about how things are going to this email address, mission trip at mclanebible.org. And I am so thankful for how so many of you have responded. We're going to debrief more next week when we get to verse 30 in chapter 6 and the disciples come back and Jesus talks with them. But I want to give you just a, a quick glimpse into the stories I'm hearing. And I should mention that I don't have time to reply to, interact with everything you're sending in, but I'm reading every word of every story that comes in, and it is so encouraging on so many different levels, starting with the youngest in the church. So one parent wrote, my kids go out on the balcony and say hi to the garbage men and the recycling men when they come by every week. At times we've given them different things. This week we gave them chocolate bars and the gospel of John with a gospel presentation inside. I love that. Chocolate and the good news of God's great love in Jesus. So, and, and kids just going out, hey, how can we share the gospel with these men who are collecting garbage or recycling? And then you got to see this from Loudon. So shout out to the sixth grade girls at Loudon on Wednesday nights uh, out in Loudon. The students unpack what we've walked through on Sunday and just dive in deeper and pray for each other and think about how this applies to their lives. So sixth grade girls at Loudon. I'm going to show you some pictures of what they did, and I removed their names for their privacy. But they wrote out like their mission trip plan. Who are the people they're going to share the gospel with? Where are the places they're going to focus? who they're going to partner together with for accountability, and then what they called their connecting point, basically questions they would ask to get gospel conversations started, like, do you go to church, or do you know who Jesus is? So good. So well done, sixth grade girls at Loudoun. And then other students all the way up to one member who's getting a PhD in economics, who had an opportunity to share the gospel with someone in his seminar, then so many conversations with coworkers, a couple people who had opportunities to share like with their whole office at one time, then neighbors and friends and family members and cancer support groups, then with new people that people were meeting this week at Starbucks or on the metro or in a restaurant or at a store. And yes, different people saying, that was hard at times, I totally chickened out or other times, not sure I nailed it. Or pretty sure I didn't nail it, but I tried. But here's the beauty, and I'll, I'll just share this, and we'll, we'll unpack more next week. But 
and a variety of these different stories, people shared about how unbeknownst to them, the person they were sharing with was going through this or that in their life in a way that they said, I really needed to hear that today. Or even said, you know, I was just thinking about that. And it was such a clear reminder to me as I'm reading this, and I hope it's an encouragement to you, that when you and I go and share the gospel, it's not like we're starting God's work. We are joining in work that God is already doing in other people's lives. So let's believe that. And when we have a conversation where somebody seems pretty closed off to the gospel, let's not assume that means everybody is closed off to the gospel. Let's trust, okay, maybe they weren't spiritually ready for that conversation. Maybe they'll be ready another time, maybe as a result of this conversation. But I'm trusting that somewhere in my sphere of influence over the next week, God's working in somebody's lives, somebody's life, and I want to join in what he's doing. Let's walk out this faith journey in ways that are good for us and eternally good for others. So let's keep going. We've got one more week on this mission trip. Think this week, who can you share the gospel with specifically in your life? People you know, you go to school with, you work with, you live next to, or people you just so happen to meet this week. Who can you share the gospel with? How will you be intentional to share the gospel with them? And when are you going to do that? This week. What's your plan? Let's do this on mission together. Then share your stories at missiontrip at mclanebible.org, uh, and we'll debrief them more next week. So that's one reason this Sunday is particularly significant, being in the middle of our Metro DC mission trip. Then the second reason is because this is a family worship Sunday, which means we don't have Kids quests for children during worship or access for special needs. So we periodically give our kids quest and access workers a week off. We are so thankful for all they do week in and week out. We want to honor them. And we actually want to encourage kids of all ages to be in worship together. And not even just on these particular Sundays. So yes, On a family worship Sunday like this, when we don't have kids' quest or access, you kind of don't have a choice but to bring your kids with you into worship. But even when you do have a choice, we strongly encourage parents to worship together with your family, neither 9 or 11, and then let them go to age-appropriate activities for kids or students during the other time. You might say, well, what will I do in that other time? I'm glad you asked. And the answer to that question is serve in the body of Christ. Serve other children or students or those with special needs or in some other way in the church. As a parent of many kids, I know I have the primary responsibility in their lives of teaching them to follow Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that privilege. At the same time, I am also very thankful for other brothers and sisters in the church who are helping me do that with each of my kids. You know that old ancient African saying that it takes a village to raise a child? Well, I would propose it takes a church to raise a child. And God has actually designed it that way for the church, the people in whom his spirit dwells to help each other in parenting and pointing the next generation to Jesus. This is why we did a parenting conference all day yesterday to help parents better better disciple their kids. And so many of you still came out, even in the middle of all the snow coming down. If you missed that, watch the E! News at whatever location you're at this week for a link to the recording so you can listen in. But then, not just for parents in our own homes, this is also why we encourage and in a sense expect everyone in the church, regardless of whether you're a parent or a grandparent or not a parent, a single or a young adult, we encourage and expect you to seriously consider serving the next generation. 
or those with special needs through our access ministry. And I realize that kind of expectation does not make sense if church exists solely for your comfort. Like if church exists solely for your comfort, then we design things for you to get in here, get a latte at the door, have a nice smooth experience when you walk in this room without any babies or kids around you to disrupt anything, take them somewhere else, then pick them up on your way out in a way that is as convenient as possible for you. But instead of that picture, we actually actively, strongly encourage you to come in with your kids, with all the mess that could involve, and worship together. Let your children see their parents lifting their voices and their hands to God in songs of joy and adoration and praise and awe and thanksgiving. Let them watch you sitting under the teaching of God's word, taking notes and submitting to whatever it says. Let them see you confessing over your sins, at times with tears in your eyes before celebrating Jesus' sacrifice for you in the Lord's Supper. Just think about the cumulative effect between the ages of, okay, let's say between four or five and 17. You count them up. That's over 600 worship services spent with mom and or dad in authentic, passionate praise of God. You cannot measure the impact of that as a parent. And people will say, yeah, but so much of the service, even the sermon, will be over their head. And this is where I want to say that Mike and I and those who lead in worship and other location pastors try to be very intentional to speak to children and teenagers and adults in our worship, knowing that, of course, some things will be over their heads. But isn't that okay? Like when they come out of the womb, the English language is over their head too. But we don't say, let's only put them with other children so they can understand the language they speak. No, we immerse them in the English language, none of which they understand, with the expectation that they will grow to understand and use it. Do we not want the same with the language of God's word and worship? And at the same time, we need to make sure we don't underestimate what they do understand. Don't for a second underestimate the teachable moments that are happening. What an opportunity when we learn to dialogue with our kids after worship gatherings, explain different things to him in a way that fuels their spiritual growth and their relationship with God. It just doesn't seem right or wise that as parents, we would take our children in their most, most formative years and only let them be with other children. Teenagers only do with other teenagers to shape their understanding of God's worship and God's word. We want to model for them what it means to worship God and be under his word. And if you're still not convinced, the research is there. Children and students who participate in intergenerational worship and have greater connection to the larger church body have a significantly higher likelihood of holding fast to their faith and remaining in church after they graduate high school. Obviously, none of us can guarantee anything about the hearts of our children, but don't we want to do every single thing we can so that they know and love God? Do we want that for our kids? Then let's worship alongside them. And church, college students, singles, married, married with no kids, married with kids, empty nesters, widows, instead of coming to a service on a Sunday and just focusing on ourselves and what we want or need, let's spend time either at 9 or 11 or on Wednesday nights teaching the Bible to the next generation, holding some babies to give exhausted moms and dads a break, being a buddy to somebody with special needs, giving parents of children with special needs a break. So many ways to serve others in the church. Again, if personal comfort is our goal, then coming early or sticking around for a couple of additional hours on Sunday is out of the question. And our faith can die with us. But if caring for the body of Christ is our goal, if making disciples among generations to come is our goal, if actually passing our faith on instead of letting it die with us 
this is our goal, then we put aside our comforts and we teach the next generation to know God and love God. That sounds like an extremely valuable use of a couple of hours on a Sunday morning if we have our priorities right in this world. All of this today to say, today is the day where we're giving those who are serving a week off and reinforcing the value of the next generation in worship. But here's the problem today. Brooke Taylor, who coordinates our children's ministries across all our locations, sent me a message a couple weeks ago and said, uh, David, we have a problem. So we're scheduled to have Family Worship Sunday on March 13th. And the text that we're scheduled to study that day in the book of Mark is the beheading of John the Baptist. So what were you thinking when you put together the plan for the walking through the sermon series? And I, I thought, well, I clearly wasn't thinking about this particular day, but to, in my defense, I didn't determine what the next text in Mark is. Mark did that a couple thousand years ago, so I'm going to put this on him, but I did, I did look at the schedule and not make the connection with this text and this particular day, but I just sent Brooke a message back. I said, we're, we're going for it, and I'm trusting this will be good for all ages because God's Word is good for all ages. But I do want to start by doing something that is specifically for kids in our gathering today. And hopefully that kid and all of us will enjoy it in a way that will lead us right into the story of John the Baptist. So you may have noticed during this series through Mark, we actually skipped over the end of Mark chapter 4 and all of Mark chapter 5. The reason we did that is because we study those passages specifically together right when the pandemic started and everything around us was shutting down. It's two years ago at this time. I was looking back. It was March 15th, 2020, almost exactly two years ago when we held our first online-only worship services. What a two years it has been. But during that time, we studied the miracles of Jesus at the end of Mark 4 and into Mark 5, the first miracle of which was the story of Jesus being on a boat with his disciples in the middle of the sea when a massive storm rose up around them that had even fishermen afraid for their lives. And Jesus stood up in the middle of the boat, and he spoke, and he said, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, the wind stopped, and the waves stilled. Now, because we had recently studied that passage, we skipped over it a couple weeks ago, but when I was thinking about emphasizing family worship today, I thought, this is a bit of a risk, maybe one of the biggest risks I've taken on this stage. But there is a great family worship song that goes with that story. So I'm going to take the risk, and I'm going to try to lead us together across all our locations in a song. Now, that's a risk on multiple levels. It's a risk because, one, I don't lead songs. I speak. I sing when this is not on. And because this song has some motions, and it's going to be super awkward if I'm the only one up here singing and doing motions to a song. So I've enlisted some help to come out here on stage. So as these guys are coming out, I want to make sure nobody bailed. Uh, there we go. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody's bailed yet. In fact, we have some new, new people coming out. All right. I love it. All right. So yes. All right. All these guys. So all of these guys, I'm so thankful for. These are teenagers in the rock ministry who here at our Tyson's location every Sunday are serving in Kids Quest. So they're setting the example by, as part of the next generation, passing the gospel on to the next generation. So um, anyway, so they're usually serving. You're supposed to have a week off. Instead, I brought you up on stage as a teenager to do a song with motions. Y'all are awesome. So they're gonna help us out but you're involved too. So at this moment, I wanna invite everybody to stand in this room at every other location. And as you're standing, I'll just say, so if you're a follower of Jesus, like you gotta join in here, all right? And, and I know some of you are thinking, man, I came last week, you said I'm on a mission trip that I didn't sign up for. Now I'm doing a song with motions, like I'm not coming back next week. So again, this is not about your comfort. And 
And like, I, I, I trust this will be worth it. If you're not a follower of Jesus, then you totally get a pass on this. I mean, some of you, this is, this is where I'm actually most nervous because some of you, like it was a lot to even visit a church and you already maybe have this idea that Christians are kind of weird and this is not gonna help that narrative in your mind. And so anyway, so feel free, just kind of just observe and just hang with me to the end, not just of the song, but of the sermon. And I, I hope it'll, it'll bring it all together for you. So, all right. The name of the song is with Jesus in your boat. So I'm going to put up on the screen uh, the one line that is in this song. So with Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. So there's, it kind of repeats itself at a couple different points. I'm going to be the only one with the microphone. I promised these guys I would not give them the microphone uh, so they wouldn't have to be worried about that. So it's just my amazing voice leading you. So... I would just say, as soon as you catch on, please join in. As soon as you catch on. All right? So here's how the song goes. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. There it is. Okay, you're kind of joining in, which I appreciate. Appreciate, all right. And I'm, I'm really hoping in other locations, you guys are actually joining in. You're not just laughing at us at Tyson's like, joke's on you, we're just watching. So, so let, let's try to sing that all together. I mean, it, hopefully pretty simple. So let's just sing it all together. Then we'll add some motions in. All right, here, let's go. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. Sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. All right, you got the song. Okay, now we're going to start to insert some motions. It's going to get a little challenging. So this next time we sing it, instead of saying Jesus, you're not going to say Jesus. Instead, you're just going to point to heaven. Amen. Okay? So in, don't say Jesus, just point up whenever Jesus comes up in the song. Okay, you got it? Pretty simple. Here we go. With in your boat, you can smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. Smile in the storm. With in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. Let's clap it up. Sailing, sailing home. Sailing, sailing home with in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. All right, that was pretty good. Well done. So far, you're doing better than 9 o'clock did. Uh, so uh, this time, instead of saying boat, so you say, same thing with Jesus, and then instead of saying boat, what are we going to do? We're going to do like this right here, okay? So instead of saying Jesus, point up. Instead of saying boat, do this right here like a boat, okay? You ready? With in your... You can smile in the storm, smile in the storm, smile in the storm with in your, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home, sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home with in your, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. All right, never mind what I said about you doing better than 11 o'clock or 9 o'clock because that was, that was so, so don't say boat, don't say Jesus, all right? This next one, this will be a little easier not to speak because you got to do something with your mouth. Instead of saying smile, you're going to do a big, broad, over-exaggerated smile and point to it. So it's, all right, that's smile. Everybody practice? Okay, there you go. All right, you ready? With, in your, you can, in the storm, in the storm, in the storm, with, in your, you can in the storm when you're sailing home. Sailing, sailing home. Sailing, sailing home with. And you're, you can in the storm when you're sailing home. Now, I know you think the joke's on me because I'm the one having to sing, but we get to watch a room full of people doing this right here. It's actually pretty epic. So, all right, this one, now it gets a little harder. This one on storm, instead of saying storm, you're going to 
do a big, over-exaggerated blow with your mouth twice. You're going to go, okay? And if you need to, do it kind of down because you don't want to do it all over the person in front of you. So, all right, you ready? Here we go. With, in your, you can, in the, in the, in the, with, in your, you can, in the, when you're sailing home, sailing, sailing home, sailing, sailing home with, in your, you can, in the, when you're sailing home. Well done, well done. All right, we got two more motions to insert. So this time, instead of sailing, we're going to do this right here, like we're on the water, okay? And we're going to hum. So, hmm, hmm, that's sailing, hmm, hmm, okay? Ready? You got it? Here we go. With, in your, you can, in the, in the, in the, with, in your, you can, in the, when you're hmm hmm home, hmm hmm home, hmm 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 home with, and you you can in the when you're hmm hmm home. Well done. All right. Hopefully you guys at locations are nailing it. So we got one more to add in, and that's home. And so this time we're gonna do a house kind of a sign and hum again. So hmm. That's home. Hmm. All right, you ready? We got it all. Here we go. With, in your, you can, in the, in the, in the, with, in your, you can, in the, when you're, hmm, 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 in the when you're hmm, hmm, hmm. Well done, well done. Okay, we're not finished yet. I'm laughing. I, I saw somebody walk in, presumably a little late for the service, and they're walking into this like, what is going on? So anyway, somebody give that person some context. Um, so, uh, so we're going to do this two more times, but here's what we're going to do. The first time, we're going super super slow motion. So we're doing it in slow-mo. And then the second time, we're going to go super, super, super fast motion. So super slow-mo, super fast motion. All right? So we'll start with slow motion. You ready? Where in your you can in the In the, in the, where, in your, you can, in the, when your, mmm, 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 <laughs> With in your you can in now when you are mm, mm, mm. well done, well done. It's so good. Okay. Alright, now last one. Stretch if you need to. This is super, super fast motion. Here we go. You ready? As fast as you can do it. With and your you can in the in the in the with and your you can in the when you're with and your you can in the when you're well done. Let's give it up for these guys from the Rock. Well done, well done. And you can have a seat. And it's finally over. <laughs> that moment some of you have been waiting for. It's over. Ah, you're going to remember that line with Jesus in your boat. 
you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. And you think about it, I would submit that's a pretty theologically profound and personally encouraging truth. Oh, yes. And I think I'm looking across this gathering right now and there's a variety of people walking through storms in your life, in your family, some of you with kids, students, or with parents, in your work, in the world, in a world of war and strife. God, we pray for your peace and for your mercy over Ukraine and surrounding countries. But there's actually a way to smile, even in the middle of the storms in our lives. Amen. In the storms in this world, there's a joy to be had, an otherworldly calm and supernatural peace to be experienced in the middle of the storm when you're sailing home. And that's a good word, isn't it? The storm is not home. The storm is what you're in when you're on the way home. But the storm isn't home. Home is coming. Amen. As long as Jesus is in your boat, home is coming where the storm will be no more. Amen. No more winds or waves of hurt or heartache or pain or grief or fear or anxiety. Now one day we'll be home and the storms will be gone. And even just knowing that can make you smile oh, yeah. in the middle of the storm. And all of this only possible when Jesus, God in the flesh, is in the boat with you. Amen. You can smile when you know that the God who has power over the storm, the God who has purposes in the storm, the God who promises to get you through the storm, has not left you alone. And he is with you every step of the way. Yes. You're not facing that storm alone. Yes. So, you may not sing that song and do those motions this week. Or you may. In private. But, regardless, remind yourself of this truth. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. And I want to show you that's true according to this story of John the Baptist. So it's interesting the way Mark tells this story. Because in verse 13, so let's get the picture. Where we left off last week, Mark tells us about Jesus sending his disciples out on this mission trip. And then if you jump down to verse 30, where we're going to start next week, he talks about these disciples coming back. But in between, Mark doesn't tell us anything about what actually happened on the mission trip. Instead, he tells us a story about John the Baptist that had happened way prior to this. If you don't know much about John the Baptist, he was the forerunner of Jesus who came baptizing people for repentance of sins and pointing them to Jesus. And this is the story of how he was martyred. And even in just the way Mark sandwiches this story of John the Baptist in between the disciples of Jesus going out on mission and coming back, he's making a point. Because these disciples were going out on mission into a hostile world, into a world of storms, and it would not be easy for them. And this is a truth for all followers of Jesus to realize, from the youngest to the oldest, following Jesus on mission in this world will involve storms. Amen. So don't be surprised when they come. Don't be surprised at the cost that comes your way when you're on mission with the Word of God in this world. In fact, following Jesus on mission in this world may cost you your life. And this is good for all of us to realize, no matter how young or old we are. So even kids who are considering following Jesus hear loud and clear today from God that following Jesus could cost you everything. Follow along with this story as I read it from Mark chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod 
heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask for me whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorrow. But because, sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So yes, this is a very heavy story with a very clear picture of the hostility against God and his word and his ways in the world. Just look at King Herod here. You, you think your family tree is crooked? Try to follow this. So there are other Herods mentioned in the Bible. This one is Herod Antipas. Mark calls him King Herod. Matthew calls him Herod the Tetrarch. He's basically governor over a certain region of Roman occupation. And that region happened to be where Jesus' ministry was primarily taking place. Now, Herod had a wife who was the daughter of an Arabian king. And they got married as kind of a political military alliance. So you had Herod Antipas and his Arabian wife. Well, one day, they go to visit Herod Antipas' half-brother, or half-brother whose name was Herod Philip. And Herod Philip was married to Herodias, which means that, so follow this, Herodias was Herod Antipas' sister-in-law. But not only was she his sister-in-law, Herodias was also Herod Antipas' niece. So you've got Herod Antipas married to his Arabian wife, Herod Philip married to Herodias, who is Herod Antipas' niece and sister-in-law. So during this trip to Philip and Herodias, Antipas decides he wants to marry Herodias, his niece, sister-in-law. So they sneak away together, and basically Antipas divorces his Arabian wife and marries his niece, sister-in-law, Herodias. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Antipas and Herodias have a daughter together, the girl who's mentioned in this story, just to finish out her story, one day she marries her half-uncle, Philip the Tetrarch, and just like that, she becomes the sister-in-law and aunt of her own mother. Do you follow that? Now, if you're wondering why any of that really matters, it doesn't. But I just want you to see how messed up this picture is. And it's in this passage where we read about Herod hearing about all that Jesus and his disciples are doing in his region, which gets him scared because he thinks Jesus is John the Baptist come back to life, which then leads Mark to tell us the story of what happened. A while before this, when Herod's daughter did a dance before what was likely her drunk father and his friends offered her whatever she wanted, and behind the scenes, Herodias tells her daughter, ask for John the Baptist's head. All because John before that 
at great risk to his own life, had called out Herod on his adulterous, incestuous actions. And as a result, Herod imprisoned John in a dungeon, but didn't want to kill him because there was a sense in which Herod respected John. But Herodias didn't. John was a threat to her marriage, so she had John killed. There's all kinds of things we could dive into at this point. But the main picture I want you to see is it's not just a story about John the Baptist. You see, this is in part a foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. Herod, with charge over a region where John the Baptist is preaching, and in his leadership, or lack thereof, he beheads John the Baptist. You fast forward one day to Jesus' trial, and you'll see in Luke chapter 23 that Pilate sent Jesus to guess who? Herod. This same Herod who would one day play another passive role that would lead to Jesus' death. But it's not just John the Baptist and Jesus, but Jesus' disciples, these same disciples who are out on a mission trip while Mark is telling us this story, You read their stories amidst Roman occupation, and as they scatter into different places, apart from Judas, who betrayed Jesus, for all we know, 10 out of 11 of those disciples died martyrs' deaths. The only one who didn't was John, another John, who was exiled on an island for speaking the gospel. So the Bible's clear. Kids, adults, mark it down. You give your life to following Jesus and speaking God's word, the gospel in this world, you will face more storms, not less. This wasn't just true back then. This is true today. Last week, I told a story about the gospel spreading in Bihar, India, in awesome ways. But that doesn't mean it's easy. Years ago, I started working with Open Doors, who helps churches serve persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Watch this video that they put together that talks about the cost of following Jesus and gathering as the church, specifically in various parts of India. Watch this with me. Who are your heroes? Are they people who are famous, good-looking, rich, or powerful? Maybe they're not like that at all. Even people who are poor and powerless can be heroes because of the way they live. In countries like India, one of the biggest countries in the world, there are many people who are heroes. Being a Christian here sometimes takes great courage and strength for children as well as adults. Imagine, for instance, that you're part of a Hindu family but have decided to become a Christian. Some of your uncles who are Christians started taking you along to their amazing church, which has grown from 25 to 250 people in just a few years. But some very bad things have happened too. The pastor has been beaten up several times for his faith. In other places, Christians have been chased out of their homes by angry mobs. And there can be trouble for children who are Christians too. Children like you. You want to follow Jesus, but your parents want you to follow the family tradition, so they sent you to a Hindu school. It means you have to take part in Hindu activities, which you just don't want to do. It leaves you very confused. Right now, however, you're on a special weekend for Christians your age who need encouragement and support, and all the activities are about following Jesus. You're sitting next to Kiara, whose father was very angry when she decided to become a Christian and even beat her up. Her mum became a Christian through dreaming about Jesus, but now Kiara's father is angry with both of them and life is very hard. Another friend you've made is Mishti. When she was 10, her village, which was full of Christian families, was attacked and they were forced to flee to the forest. They had no food or water for four days and were all very scared. After that, they went to live in a refugee camp. Since then, Open Doors partners have helped rebuild their homes and things are getting better. 
The weekend has helped everyone to learn more about living like Jesus. Singing together has been fun too. And when you say goodbye, you promise to pray for each other. As you leave, you remember the different Bible stories you've heard and the verse that says, we must never stop looking to Jesus. He is the leader of our faith and he is the one who makes our faith complete. Do you think Jesus is a hero? When I first watched that video and saw how it ended, I was, I was kind of surprised. I thought it would end, much like it started with talking about how our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world in India and other places are heroes. Because they are, they are absolutely examples to follow and worthy of our admiration and prayer and support. Were there were admiration far more than athletes or musicians or successful leaders or social media personalities in this world. But when I heard and I saw that last question on that video, I thought, you know, that is the right question. Do you think Jesus is not just a hero, but the hero? of all history. Or maybe a more personal way to put it, is Jesus the hero of your life? So this is where I mentioned, if you just hang with me, if you're exploring Christianity, the story of the Bible is the story of one hero who is worthy of not just admiration, but awe and worship, and not just for a time, but for all time. It's the story of how God has formed and created each one of us fearfully and wonderfully in his image for relationship with him. Amen. But it's also the story of how all of us in different ways have turned aside from him, have sinned against him, chosen our ways over his word. And it's the story of how, as a result of our sin, we live in a world of so many storms. Amen. It's a world that's separated from God. And if nothing changes, when we die, we will go to an eternity of everlasting suffering separated from God. But the Bible is also the story of how God loves us so much that he sent his son, Amen. Jesus, to this world to live the life that we could not live, a life of no sin. And then, even though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die on a cross for sinners to pay the price for their sin. He died the death we deserve to die. And then the good news keeps getting better because he didn't stay dead long. Three days later, he rose from the grave so that anyone, anywhere, who turns from their sin and puts their trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of their life will be forgiven of all their sin and restored to relationship with God now and for all of eternity. Jesus has lived the life we could not live. He has died the death we deserve to die. And he has conquered the enemy we could not conquer. He is the hero of all history. Yes. And he is the only hero who is worthy of all of our worship. Yes. We invite you then, from the youngest to the oldest, in, within the sound of my voice, we urge you, Put your trust in Jesus Amen. early in your life, as soon as possible in your life. Yes. Make Jesus the hero of your story. Yes. Your life now and forever depends on it. Yes. At the same time, know this. Know this one simple, significant truth today from God's word. If you believe that Jesus is the hero of history and that Jesus is worthy of all your worship, 
know that following him will not lead to an easy, comfortable life in this world. Not when you're following the hero who was crucified by this world. Not when you're following this hero who's leading you to another world. And along the way, it's calling you to forsake possessions and pleasures and pursuits in this world and the applause of this world because he knows all of these things are fading. None of them will last. So realize, regardless of how old you are, if you're in elementary school right now or middle school or high school, college, if you're in your 20s, or 30s, or 40s, or 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Regardless, if you're going to follow Jesus, you are joining in a line behind John the Baptist who gave his life pointing people to Jesus. He must become greater. I must become less. Which meant proclaiming God's word even in this world even when that cost him everything. So are you willing to follow Jesus in that line behind John the Baptist? If not, then you are not actually following Jesus. And you might say, but he died. They cut off his head in this world. But that's the point. John wasn't living for this world. He wasn't living for worldly kings and temporary pleasures. He was living for a heavenly king with everlasting pleasures. John wasn't living for an earthly hero. He was living and dying for an eternal hero. The question is, are you? And if the answer to that question is yes, If Jesus, the hero of history, is the hero of your story, then you can know this. No matter what storms you may face in this world, even down to the storm of death itself, you can smile because you know you're sailing home. Will you bow your heads with me? I just want to ask you that question. I ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, just to focus between you and God. Is Jesus the, the hero of your life? The Lord, Savior, King of your life. And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, then I invite you. This is the moment, the time where you Right there, you can just call out from your heart to God and say, God, I know you have made me for a relationship with you. I know I have turned away from you in so many ways. But today I believe that Jesus is the hero of all history who has died on a cross for my sin and risen from the grave so that I could have life so that I could be restored to you. So today I confess him as Lord, as Savior, as hero of my life. You call out on the name of Jesus in that way. The Bible says everyone who calls on his name as Lord will be saved from your sin, restored to God. God, I pray for that miracle to happen in hearts all across this gathering right now. And for all of us who have experienced this miracle, either for the first time in this moment or in times leading up to this, we thank you for this reminder today that the storms in this world are not the end. Even the reminder that following you and proclaiming your word in this world will lead to more storms, not less. We say to you, Jesus, the hero of history and the hero of our lives, you are more than worth it. We want to follow you wherever, however you lead us. We want to speak your word. 
your, the good news of your love, no matter what that means for our lives. God, help us even this week and the second week of this mission trip we're doing. God, please give us courage to, and boldness to speak your word, to speak the gospel, especially in light of the brothers and sisters in India for whom it's so much more costly than just our reputation or lack of comfort in a conversation. God, please help us to speak your word. And we pray that you would bring people to life in you today through your word spoken through us. Oh God, we look forward to the day when storms will be no more. We long for that day. At the same time, we praise you that you're in the middle of the boat with us right now. So lead us on, guide us, help us to live and die, proclaiming your word in this world as we look forward to seeing your face and to the day when storms will be no more. In Jesus' name we pray. The name of the one who makes all this possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.